Good afternoon and welcome to the CEU lectures. I'm John Shattuck, President and Rector of Central European University. It's my great privilege to introduce this special series of five lectures by George Soros held here in Budapest at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences under the auspices of Central European University. In these lectures, George Soros will draw upon a lifetime of practical and philosophical reflection and share his latest thinking on economics and politics. Today, Mr. Soros will present the fundamentals of his philosophical theory. Each lecture will be video conferenced to one of five universities on four continents, creating an unprecedented interactive international audience of students in real time. Today's lecture will include students from the London School of Economics, in addition to the invited guests and Central European University students who are here at the Academy. Our moderator today is the distinguished philosopher Colin McGinn, renowned for his work in the philosophy of mind. Mr. Soros will lecture for approximately 50 minutes, and Mr. McGinn will offer a brief response. Mr. Soros will then take questions from the audience, starting with three questions from the London School of Economics and then from our audience here in Budapest. I'm now delighted to present George Soros, who truly needs no introduction. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you for all for coming, and both here and in London. In the course of, of my life, I've developed a conceptual framework which has helped me both in make money, making money as a hedge fund manager and in spending it as a policy-oriented philanthropist. But the framework itself is not about money. It's about the relationship between thinking and reality, a subject that is extensively studied by philosophers from early on. <clears throat> I started developing my philosophy as a student at the London School of Economics in the late 1950s. I took my final exams one year early, and I had a year to fill before I was qualified to receive my degree. I could choose my own tutor, and I chose Karl Popper, who, uh, whose uh, book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, had made a profound impression on me. In his books, Popper argued that the uh, empirical truth can't be known with absolute certainty. Even scientific laws can't be verified beyond the shadow of a doubt. They can only be falsified by testing. One failed test is enough to, to falsify, but no amount of confirming instances is sufficient to verify. Scientific laws are hypothetical in character, and their truth remains subject to testing. Ideologies, which claim to be in possession of the ultimate truth, are making a false claim. Therefore, they can be imposed on society only by force. This applies to communism, fascism, and national socialism alike. All these ideologies lead to re repression. Popper proposed a more attractive form of social organization, a society, an open society in which people are free to hold divergent opinions and the rule of law allows people with different views and different interests to live together in peace. Having lived through both Nazi and communist occupation here in Hungary, I found the idea of an open society immensely attractive. While I was reading Popper, I was also studying economic theory, and I was struck by the contradiction between Popper's emphasis on imperfect understanding and the theory of perfect competition in economics, which postulated perfect knowledge. This led me to start questioning the assumptions of economic theory. 
These were the two major the theoretical inspirations of my philosophy. It's also deeply rooted in my personal history. <clears throat> the, formative the formative experience of my life was the German occupation of Hungary in 1944. I was not yet 14 years old at the time. Coming from a reasonably well-to-do middle-class background, suddenly confronted with the prospect of being deported and killed just because I was Jewish. Fortunately, my father was well prepared for this far from equilibrium experience. He had lived through the Russian Revolution, and that was the formative experience of his life. Until then, he had been an ambitious young man. When the First World War broke out, he volunteered to serve in the Austro-Hungarian army. He was captured by the Russians and taken as a prisoner of war to Siberia. Being ambitious, he became the editor of a newspaper produced by the prisoners. It was handwritten and displayed on a plank, and it was called the plank. This made him so popular that he was elected the prisoner's representative. Then uh, some soldiers escaped from a neighboring camp, and their prisoner's representative was shot in retaliation. My father, is, instead of uh, uh, waiting for the same thing to happen in his camp, organized a breakout. His plan was to build a raft and sail down to the ocean. But his knowledge of geography was somewhat deficient. He didn't realize that all the rivers uh, in Siberia flow into the Arctic. They drifted for several weeks before they, they realized that they were heading for the Arctic. And it took them several more months to make their way back to civilization across the taiga. In the meantime, the Russian Revolution broke out and they became caught up in it. Only after a variety of adventures did my father manage to find his way back to Hungary. Had he remained in the camp, he would have arrived home much sooner. <clears throat> my father came home a changed man. His experiences during the Russian Revolution profoundly, profoundly affected him. He lost his ambition and wanted nothing more from life than to enjoy it. He imparted to his children values that were very different from those of the milieu in which we lived. He had no desire to amass wealth or become socially prominent. On the contrary, he worked only as much as was necessary to make ends meet. I remember being sent to his main client to borrow some money before we went on a skiing holiday. My father was grouchy for months afterwards because he had to work to pay it back. <clears throat> Although we were reasonably prosperous, we were not the typical bourgeois family, and we were proud of being different. <clears throat> in 1944, when the Germans occupied Hungary, my father immediately realized that these were not normal times, and the normal rules didn't apply. He arranged false identities for his family and a number, number of other people. Those who could, paid. Uh, uh, others, he helped for free. Most of them survived. That was his finest hour. Living with false identity turned out to be an exhilarating experience for me, too. We were in mortal danger. People perished all around us, but we managed not only to survive, but to help other people. We were on the side of the angels, and we triumphed against overwhelming odds. This made me feel very special. It was high adventure. I had a reliable guide in my father and came through unscathed. What more could a 14-year-old ask for? After the euphoric experience of escaping the Nazis, life in Hungary started 